But you are wonderful, Supergirl. And do you let me add that I simply adore your new look. So chic, so with it, especially the headband. Oh yes, it's time. The band, the myth, the 80s. Greetings comic lovers and welcome back to Casually Comics, the channel where we chat all things comics, from reviews of comics new and old, to history, to anecdotes, to really wherever our whims take us. Before Supergirl was killed off in 1985 in Crisis on Infinite Earth so that Superman could be the last surviving Kryptonian, allegedly, she had two ongoing solo series and also a big stint in Superman Family as one of the main titles. That was a break in between the 1972 series and the one that we're about to look at. The first, the confusing run of the early 1970s, lasted for 10 issues. And it was a bit of, well, a lot of a mess. We did a retrospective on it here on this channel, so check it out. I will have links and cards up in the corner. Oops, I just lost a terrific date, and I was so anxious to have Bob really dig me. Cliff Notes, it was a series with almost no connective through line. It didn't know what it wanted, and Kara slash Linda to be doing, except for going on dates slash having boy trouble. It had some funny moments, and some moments of potential, but ultimately it didn't come together, or come through. This is not the Supergirl series to show a new, basically, if you're trying to convince them that Kara had a lot going on and is worth reading. It's also almost the exact opposite of the 80s series. The 80s and Supergirl tend to conjure up images of the infamous headband, but there's so much more to her series than that, and the headband doesn't even actually appear until issue 17, and that's 17 of 23. But I guess when you die in it, it kind of gets immortalized. So we're going to take a look at the entirety of the daring new adventures of Supergirl. Do you dare? I'll see myself out. But before we get started, I'm Sasha, and if you're enjoying this content, you know what to do. Hit that like button and hit the subscribe button. Join us on this comic book journey. We have a Supergirl playlist now. The time has come. We also have merch. So if you're interested in picking up some tees or sweaters or really anything, mugs, we have it all. So check that out too. The daring new adventures of Supergirl ran from 1982 to 1984. For the first year, starting in issue two, there was also a Lois Lane backup that ran in it. You know I'm all about that. The entire series was written by Paul Cooperberg, and the art was done by Carmine Infantino, except for one issue, issue 21, which was illustrated by Eduardo Barreto. This series takes the concepts from the 70s, but presents them in an entirely updated way. It's also much more coherent and enthusiastic. In the 70s, Kara was going back to school to get a drama degree, for reasons. In this series, she's going back to school because she wants a psych degree, so that she can better understand the criminals that she faces. She also wants to more firmly establish her Linda Danvers persona. She actually wants to make it a life, not just a cover. She feels that since unlike Clark, she wasn't raised on Earth, she tends to slip into her Supergirl persona and just stay there. And she doesn't just want to be Supergirl 24-7. She wants to find a balance and find out who she is now that she's here on Earth. We have motivation, people. Issue 1. Our cover showcases a joyful Supergirl flying above the city. She's got a slightly modified version of the costume she wore in the 70s series. It had begun to be tweaked in her Superman family run. This issue sees Linda and her amazing amazing outfit on the train on the way to uni. And the narration box waxes poetic. It sets a very amusing tone bordering on novelesque. The age of rail travel is not quite over. Oh, perhaps these modern trains lack the glory of earlier days and famed runs like the 20th Century Limited and Orient Express, yet run they still do, catering to those with a fear of flying or who still prefer to actually see where they are headed. Or for those who it's just the most convenient option. Felt like we were slipping a bit into a period piece for a minute there. The narration boxes aren't all that romantic, but they are more meditative. It's a tone that makes the series feel like it's taking itself a bit more seriously. Though some may feel it borders on saccharine at points. Linda saves some workers from an imminent breach on the way there, but while she's pleased, this triggers her thinking that she wants to be more than a symbol. She also wants to be a person. And so she recounts her backstory, or begins to. It's broken up throughout this issue. The one thing I'm not certain of is why her biological parents aren't mentioned. Because they're alive. Argo City did blow up, but then her parents were found in a pocket dimension, kind of similar to the Phantom Zone, the survival zone, and they were then transferred to Kandor, the bottle city of Kandor, and then Kandor was sent somewhere else and enlarged. So they're not around exactly, but the story makes it sound like they're dead. You have explanations that I don't have, I'll leave them down below. Still, the backstory recap is good, and it gives you what you need to know for this series. You can jump in and feel like, okay, I know Supergirl, I can do this. We are then introduced to many characters, some who will remain throughout the entire series, and not only that, they're gonna do things. She meets a woman named Joan who will become a friend and who sets her up with an apartment. She meets some of her neighbors, including a man named John Ostrander. And you may be thinking, I know that name. Why do I know that name? It's because you do. He's a DC Comics writer or would become one shortly after this. He would appear on the DC scene a couple of years later with the series Legends and then he would be the person who revitalizes the Suicide Squad. Him and Paul Cooperberg were friends and so he put him 
in the book as a character. Sweet. He makes him a decent and not awkward character, so there's that. Still a bit odd though. It threw me off. It was like, what? Why is he here? We also meet her landlady who will matter and some villains. We're introduced to Mr. Pendergast and his protege, student, disciple, underling. Gale, who he has been trained to fight against the decay, which is just vaguely described as society getting worse. So safe to say, he failed. Gale is pretty much an update on Wanda 5. In the 70s series in the first issue, Supergirl teams up with a woman named Wanda, who has ESP as they called it at the time, and they use her abilities to help stop a series of murders. The character is then dropped and never seen or mentioned again. In this series, Linda literally bumps into Gale, and when they make contact, there's some kind of pain caused by the psychic link. After telling Pendergast of this encounter, he feels the need to accelerate their plans and decides they need to end Decay right now. This instant. He's got a terrible costume waiting. And so Gale becomes Psy, a villain who Supergirl takes on. The name feels a bit like a nod to this one letter that was published in the 70s where a reader complained that the character should be said to have Psy abilities and not ESP because they felt that was more academically accurate. It may not be a nod to that, but it feels like it is and it amuses me to think so. Gale calls herself a mutant. I can feel legal papers being drawn up. Issue 2. A lot of this issue is the battle between Psy and Supergirl, where Supergirl tries to understand Psy's motivations, and we see that she is very much beholden to Mr. Pendergast, who is also accenting her abilities, and also that she's not 100% on board with the let's raise the entire world to stop decay plan. Psy finds herself torn between these two opinions and not sure what to do, and so she flies off, which ends up being a good thing for Supergirl because she was on par with her thanks to her telekinesis. Supergirl meets even more of her neighbors as they help her move in. There's some mild, very mild flirting between her and John Ostrander, or Johnny O as he comes to be called, but never goes anywhere, which, whew, don't write your friends in and then have them have a relationship with the main character, don't do it. Thankfully, that doesn't happen here. Such relief. I felt my body just relax. Psy has fled back to Mr. Pendergast, but he tells her that she failed, that he wasted his time, and it's all too much, and she unleashes her abilities on him, transforming him into a being called Decay, who looks like Clayface, but who has the abilities of Clayface 3, Preston Payne. He can melt things or cause them to decay upon touching them. This is meant to be a she turned him into what he hated kind of deal. Issue 3 sees Supergirl having to deal with Decay, who's melting people and things, but that's not all she does. She meets her psych prof, who is absent minded, and a mess and ends up getting a job as his assistant. This guy's unbelievable, but kind of cute actually. I didn't know colleges still kept absent-minded professors on the payroll. Insert tenure joke here. And rejoice! For this goes nowhere. It is just a passing observation. It's a normal thought, and nothing uncomfortable comes of it, except for maybe a throwaway line or two later, but nothing actually develops. It's beautiful. Today is a good day. Johnny O also gets a job working for a shady individual. This is a series where the plots build on each other. There's the A plot, B plot setup structure for most of it. Supergirl is actually losing to Decay, but Psy shows up and cleans up her mess by transforming him back into Mr. Pendergast. Not only because it's the right thing to do, but because they were linked and his actions were hurting her. She then flees. Please, alas, not to return. Also, Mr. Pendergast never comes back, but eh, he wasn't as interesting as her. Probably left so she wouldn't get sued. She also called herself a homo superior. She was coming for the X-Men's brand. Issue 4 sees the start of a new arc, but we've already had a connection laid to it thanks to Johnny's shady job. We open on a gang called The Gang. They all have terribly on-the-nose names like Brains and Mesmer. They're stealing a satellite, and Supergirl can't let that happen. Supergirl is very assertive in this series, very confident in her abilities. It's nice to see. I'm still gonna give her a Marilyn Monroe voice, though. You're punks with a gimmick. That doesn't make you unstoppable. It just means I've got to put a touch more effort into doing it. It's going well until Mesmer, well, mesmerizes her, and the gang ends up escaping. She's then yelled at by a police officer. Sorry doesn't get back the stolen satellite, and it's not a word my chief likes to see on our reports. Well, then you go get it next time, Officer Grumpy. This lays the groundwork for a plot that never fully coalesces or bears fruit, and that's tension between Supergirl and the police. I say sadly because it was interesting. The gang had to get this satellite for Johnny O's boss, Lester Adams. And he gave the payment to Johnny and he was meant to deliver it to them. Unfortunately, he thought he just had a regular courier job, so he decided he was going to push it to a bit later because he had an audition. Kara is then surprised by a visit from her adoptive parents, the Danverses, and she's thrilled to see them. Kara and her parents always had a very good, positive, open relationship. They knew about her powers and were involved with her life. But they also called her out in her nonsense. Remember when they tried to stop her from shipping her cousin with all those different people across different periods of time? I remember. She did not listen. Her dad is actually concerned she may be trying to hide away from being Supergirl, but before they can get too into that. She hears the gang trying to get the money from Johnny O. But Mesmer then triggers a suggestion she had placed inside of her mind. And that is that she will see her biggest fear it will manifest itself. And that turns out to be that her identity will be revealed to the world. And so she flees because in her mind, she's suddenly appearing as Linda. Issue 5. And it's great vertigo cover. Kara quickly runs and grabs her parents and they prove to be the real MVPs. Somebody's playing tricks on your mind. 
Believe me, Linda, you were dressed as Supergirl. The gang gets a whole backstory all about how they banded together to try to escape their terrible neighborhood. It makes them feel a lot more legit than their silly names. Kara is able to force herself to do battle as Supergirl, even though she has to overcome this mental hurdle that she's just flying around as Linda. She manages to deal with all of the gang except for Brains who escapes, and she's able to bargain with Mesmer that she'll release the hypnotic suggestion that she put on her in exchange for a flight to the hospital because she got shot. Issue six, Supergirl is on the hunt for Brains, but she also has life things to do. And we get to see some calm moments like Linda going to her job or Johnny over covering and talking to their landlady. Kara bonds with Joan a bit. She finds an orange cat and names it Streaky in honor of the first Streaky from the Legion of Super Pets. We also see Brains get captured after a giant robot rises from the surface of the lake she is hiding on. This robot is called Matrix Prime and it's going to steal something from an airport and this looks like a job for Supergirl and I will never say no to a big robot fight. While she can't defeat the robot, she does follow it back to its base under the sea. Issue 7. As Supergirl infiltrates the base, breaching the defenses, we are graced with the end of the Lester Adams plot. He worked for a mysterious organization called the Council. They were the ones who wanted the satellite, but they're mad that he hired this really flashy gang to get it and now is drawing attention to them, specifically Supergirl. Now he should counter with you unleash the giant robot, but he doesn't think of that, I guess. And so he gets executed. You gotta be quick on your feet with the comebacks. Supergirl also has to take on Matrix Prime again and sees that Brains is controlling it via Neural Link, which is why she had such a hard time with the robot on the surface. It knew her weaknesses and was trying to distract her by harming civilians or causing damage. Defeating Matrix severs the link between it and Brains and seems to cause some kind of damage because of that bond. Supergirl leaves the base after having found Adam's dead and learned very little. She's then invited to a concert by two of her neighbors who helped her move in, but it all goes awry when suddenly the negative woman unleashes her negative form, setting us up for a team up with the new Doom Patrol. Well, new at the time. 1983 new. Issue 8. The Doom Patrol stands in for Supergirl. Supergirl had already met the new Doom Patrol. This was in Superman Family in issues 191 to 193, but she can't help them here because they meet her on the scene as Linda, and then when they tell her to go away, she runs into her friends, and so they have to leave. So she has to leave them to deal with that for a bit. They're fighting Reactron, the living reactor, and his star-spangled costume. But forget about that. It's issue eight, and we're about to meet the first real love interest. Everybody stand to attention. Love interest. This is Philip Decker. He's a composer and a musician, director of the Chicago Symphony. Look at its crowd. Were people fangirling over conductors of the symphony in the 80s? I need to know. Joan tries to stage a meet cute with him by literally running into him, because I guess men love when you just knock over all their important things. Philip has eyes only for Linda and he asks her out, but that will have to wait because Reactron is making a mess. He's gonna try and absorb energy from the secret nuclear reactor that was being built on the campus by a professor associated with the council. I appreciate this pun as Supergirl comes upon him, re-enter Reactron. The fruit was low but it was good. Issue 9. It's a battle with Reactron, his starry onesie. This is all battle. Levels of battle. And some backstory for Tempest of the new Doom Patrol, Joshua Clay, who also calls himself a mutant. Stop it. Not allowed. They will sue you. Litigious. Lawsuits everywhere. We don't need this backstory for Joshua or for Reactron, but it just makes everything feel like it has more weight. And there's time for it. The battle and other interpersonal moments without everything feeling rushed or padded. Supergirl does manage to send Reactron to space, but not before absorbing a law of radiation. And some of that was the new kind of energy he had absorbed from this experimental reactor in the school. So it's different and it is affecting her. Issue 10 starts with probably the most silver agey of the arcs in this run, maybe? You can tell me at the end if you agree. The presentation is firmly Bronze Age though, it marries quite well here. That doesn't always happen. Supergirl has been trying to ignore her radiation poisoning, thinking that she's just gonna get better like she does from other things, but it's really affecting her and she's collapsing in the streets, causing property damage because, well, she's Kryptonian. And that's when she meets Lieutenant Peters, who comes to yell at her and he becomes our cop who is at every scene who's there and he doesn't like Supergirl. Lieutenant Peters is impressed by nothing that Supergirl does. How dare she collapse because she's sick. And now it's time to get ready for a throwback to classic comics. Supergirl has to get ready for her date with Philip even though she's sick. She can't miss that. But you know, this plays out in okay manner. That doesn't leave you fully skeezed out by Phil. He notices that she's off and distracted and asks her about it and she says that actually she's sick but she didn't want to miss their date. He says that that's really sweet but that she should go home home and rest and they can have a date another time. It's fine. And so he takes her home. I mean, she looks like she's about to collapse, needs to go to the hospital, but you know, steps in the right direction, 80s. He does kiss her though. Guess he's not afraid of germs. However, when she gets back to her apartment, Matrix Prime is there, this time piloted by another of the council's members. The chairman has decided that Supergirl is causing them too many problems and something must be done. This is Professor Drake and he promised that not only could he kill Supergirl, but he could then provide them with a clone, which he accomplishes by dunking her into a ghost in the shell that but it goes wrong, gloriously wrong, issue 11. He's made clones, but they're all doll size. What? 
You're not serious, Drake. What use could we possibly have for 12-inch Supergirls? This plot has wired my crops and cut my lawn. Supergirl's not dead and she manages to escape, but her powers aren't up to snuff yet, so she flees. This time she goes to the Fortress of Solitude, hoping that something there on the computers can heal her. But they send the mini Supergirls after her and she has to fight all these tiny versions of herself. They're there going through the fortress, wrecking all of Clark's mementos. And you know what? It serves him right for copying Batman. Issue 12, her little doubles grab her and throw her into a vat of something, but it does the opposite of what they want and it cures her. So the battle is on, and that's most of the issue minus an interlude. This interlude involves her landlady coming home to find a swastika painted on her door. Supergirl defeats these minis by exposing them to gold kryptonite, which removes their powers from them. By the time she gets back to the base where she was captured, the chairman is gone and Drake is dead. But Lieutenant Peters is there to be snarky. You wanna play cop? Join the department and get a badge. Until then, stay out of my way. You know what? Next time he can stop the giant robot. Issue 13, the anniversary issue. It's been a year. Also, it's now no longer the daring new adventures of Supergirl, but Supergirl. I guess the adventure is no longer daring or new. This cover also boasts of a new costume for Kara that they explain in the story. I posted this one on the community tab and some of you felt that the logo veered into Batman territory. This one opens with Clark coming back to the fortress and finding it in shambles. He's also less than interested in her costume. Halston, I'm not Kara. And to tell you the truth, I'm more interested in hearing just how my fortress came to look like a junkyard after a tornado went through it. You know of Halston, Clark. I'm impressed. How many of those Studio 54 parties did you go to? Supergirl recaps everything, and Clark is far from his creepy 60s early incarnation when he was like, mmm, two L's in her name. He tells her that he's just glad she's okay and that things can be replaced. When she counters that they can't, he says, just let it go. He's letting her off the hook. She has to go, so Clark handles cleanup of the mess, and they decide they're gonna put these little mini clones in stasis. Before we deal with the heavy plot, because it gets heavy, Heavy. Let me just detail how she got her new costume. She went to visit her parents and her costume was all messed up from these minis and her mom had designed the book and so she decided to do that. Use her mom's design. It's stunning, honey. Her dad likes her costume, Clark. Stop drinking the haterade. And now for something completely different. Our next arc has to do with the rising of neo-Nazi sentiment. There's a cell in Chicago, a little movement, and it's starting to gain traction. It's led to an increase of hate crimes in the area. Their landlady is terrified because she's a survivor from Auschwitz. She's too scared to leave her apartment after the swastika appeared. And so Joan is there keeping her company and listening to her stories and Johnny O is patrolling the building, sitting out front, trying to make sure that she feels safe. There's actually a really good exchange between Linda and Cheryl, her neighbor who she went to the concert with, because Kara is kind of dismissing why they're so afraid, with Cheryl telling her that she's a black woman and this kind of sentiment concerns her, and Kara telling her that you can't live in fear. And Cheryl tells her to talk to Mrs. Berkowitz and then see how she feels. Kara does and she's angry by what she sees, that there are people living in fear and she doesn't feel that it's right. So she decides so she needs to go investigate just what exactly is going on and see if it really poses a real tangible threat because she's still not entirely convinced that it does. Phil shows up for a date and she drags him along. I know I keep using their names interchangeably because like her persona name and her actual name, but just in case anybody's confused, Nobody here outside of the uh, Superman and her parents know that she is Supergirl. Everybody else, she's just plain old Linda and her sweet brown wig that they don't know is a wig, wig life. Violence breaks out at the rally and so Supergirl springs into action only to see the woman leading this rally has some kind of powers and goes by Black Star. The way that they draw her universe warping abilities is very trippy. Issue 14 is Supergirl versus Black Star and they're very cool fight panels, but the hits keep on coming because this arc is very deep and really goes into pain and loss, especially as it's revealed that Black Star is Mrs. Berkowitz's daughter, who she believes she had lost in Auschwitz. On a less important to this particular story, but is important overall, Phil and Linda are really starting to fall for each other. Issue 15, still Supergirl versus Black Star, even more, but also Linda's awesome outfit. Look at it. Things with Phil are good, but he's starting to wonder where she is at night, or when he shows up sometimes and she's just not there and she's pretty vague about it. She also gets a book to transcribe from her psych prof. Colonels, Colonels for later. This issue dives into the backstory of Mrs. Berkowitz and Black Star or Rachel, detailing how she lost her daughter and how her daughter managed to worm her way into the heart of a Nazi officer who brought her home. But because of this, he also raised her with his beliefs and she came to hate herself and her mother and her people. How she got her powers is a little silly though. She solved Einstein's formulas and that gave her access to the universe. She cracked the code just by solving the equation, you get powers. This ultimately leads to her demise because she makes the gravitational pull around her too strong and she kind of turns into a little black hole and sucks in inside of herself. So Mrs. Berkowitz has to deal with losing her daughter not once, but twice. 
depressing. Although the art makes it look like it's hopeful, but I felt very depressed. After all of that, issue 16 is a comedic story starring Ambush Bug. And get ready for a Phil plot. That's right, Phil's gonna have a plot. Both of these plots are very silly. Ambush Bug is showing up to be a hero, but he's being way too intense, going hard on petty offenses. He also can't tell Superman and Supergirl apart and is convinced that Superman's just been transformed. And even when she doesn't know who he is or remember things, he just assumes it's some kind of mental trickery. So Kara has to spend the whole issue trying to convince him that they're not actually the same person. As for Phil, his stole a violinist's violin has been stolen. And you know who's on the case? Lieutenant Peters, because he deals with homicides and stolen violins. The thief is someone called the Bandit, who Phil tells Linda is someone who just steals really precious instruments. And then he kidnaps Phil. And this is all because, so that with them, I may record the greatest symphony ever performed on the instruments of the masters. Nerd! So he needed the best conductor. The plots coincide and Phil does not actually get to conduct this orchestra. Years wasted for the bandit. And Ambush Bug then recognizes Linda in her Linda form and sees that she is Supergirl. So he can distinguish that. And this lays the seeds to Linda that she needs to change her look. Which leads us to issue 17, which is the headband issue. Supergirl and Joan are shopping. And in a nice subversion of tropes, the fact that Joan had found Phil attractive, but he ended up dating Linda is not a sore spot. Ever. Now remember that book that Linda was supposed to transcribe? Well, it ends up being a big deal. It was about a crime boss, because of course it was. And so he sends some goons to her prof's office to get the book, but it's at Linda's. Oh no, so they kidnap him. Supergirl tries to save her prof, but he gets swept away by the Matrix Prime robot, revealing that this has something to do with the council. Supergirl confusingly has to pretend to be Supergirl disguising herself as Linda to bring the book to them, and then pull a reveal saving her prof and saying she's read the book, so even if they kill him, she'll just write it again. So take that, because super memory. But this is further proof she needs to make more of a difference and distinction between her two identities or at least how they look. And it's also the end of wig life. Weep with me. Now she has a special comb coated with color sensitive molecules that she uses to change her hairstyles and texture at will. She dons the headband as a symbol of Krypton. And while yes, you did see Zor-El and other male Kryptonians wearing this headband, it's also such a stereotypical fashion statement of the 80s that it's hard not to see it as just that. Nice try, Jan. I see you trying to infiltrate the youth culture. Issue 18 continues to go on about this headband. But you are wonderful, Supergirl. And do let me add that I simply adore your new look. So chic. So with it, especially the headbands. Sarah tells her actually, yes, she goes full actually, that it's traditional wear on Krypton. I didn't exactly tell her the whole truth. I guess since only the males on Krypton wore the bands, but this is Earth, whatever. Traditional or not, I like the way I look these days. And then Lieutenant Peter shows up to yell at her since she just stopped a heist. But that plot abruptly ends here. She reminds him that she was deputized when Clark, or rather Superman, introduced her to Earth all the way back in issue 285. This was in 1960. So he could eat her headband. Seems like somebody wrote in and was like, mm, actually, she shouldn't have any problems with the blades. Which, I mean, you could have still updated it, but you know, it's done. It's fine. Let it go. This issue sees her battling a creature called the Kraken, who is really from another dimension and had dealings with Argo City and is seeking revenge against all of its former inhabitants. She defeats him and also, look at her outfits. The subplot here is that she goes to visit Phil, surprise him at rehearsal, but he's not there. And then when she calls him to ask about it, he lies. Dun, dun, dun. Issue 19 was one of my favorite issues in the entire run. It started off seemingly one way, but then really brings it home. Linda is watching TV with Joan. They're hanging out when all of a sudden she sees Supergirl on TV, which of course freaks her out because she's Supergirl. She decides to investigate, but when she tries to do anything, her powers are gone. And when you look at her costume, you see that she's wearing the older version, not the new 80s hip version. Meanwhile, Supergirl is superheroing nonstop. She's played by snippets of thoughts like she should go home, but she keeps thinking to what? She's always been Supergirl and nothing else. The story uses both of these perspectives to reflect on why Supergirl needs to have the identity of Linda Dan Danvers, while asking also just who is Linda Danvers without Supergirl? Linda has these memory fragments of herself in terror in a mirrored room, but she fights them, doesn't want them. But there are gaps in her life and they're starting to freak her out. The courses and the classes she attends, they're way further ahead than she remembers. She feels like she's only been dating Phil for a couple of weeks, but he says, and other people say it's been months. Slowly the two start to converge as Supergirl realizes that she is missing chunks of her life too. And when she goes through a phone book and sees a picture of Linda Danvers, she realizes that's her. And so she she seeks her out. The two meet and the reveal is amazing. It's revealed that Linda is a combined version of 
all the mini clones. They broke out and they tried to block out Supergirl's memories of Linda so that they could take her life, but it didn't work for either of them. Rather than fighting, Kara gives her her blessing and says there's room for both of them, that there are people who look alike in the world, and that this version of Linda can go out and forge her own life. Issue 20, anniversary celebration, but not of the comic, but actually of the arrival of Supergirl into the Superman universe, into the DC Comics universe. There's also a tie into the story with Action Comics 555, but you can get away without reading it. Issue 20 is a parasite story where Supergirl has to take on the Purple Menace, but with her powers drained, only things aren't exactly as they appear. It's a good story, but what really puts it over the top is the ending, when Superman pulls her aside for a surprise. He's gathered all of the superheroes to do a big celebration for her. Just that we're so glad you're here. It's really nice, but also bittersweet when you know that she's gonna be killed really shortly after this. There are quotes made that some people wrote in that the death of Supergirl was the best Supergirl story they ever read, and I don't know, I need some receipts. Issue 21 is a team up with Clark where they have to take on a being called the Kryptonite Man, a being of pure kryptonite wearing Hulk pants. It's not a bad issue, it just ends up feeling out of place because of its positioning before the book's cancellation, but that's not its fault. It's a fun team up that culminates in a battle in space. At the time of this reading though, I was starting to feel stressed because you know there's only two issues left and then you know there's no way they can wrap up everything with what they've laid down with the issues they have. That was the true suspense. Issue 22, a cover that highlights the fact that she's wearing a skirt over a bodysuit, which is an important costume detail. The story starts with Supergirl on patrol. She's having a great and helpful night, but her psych prof, not so much. Dr. Messner wakes up abruptly and finds that there's a tape recorder under his bed and he doesn't remember placing it there and it seems to be playing some kind of subliminal messaging. He then goes to the bathroom and has a horrifying hallucination. Linda and Phil have it out this issue. She confronts him about his lies, but he also brings up a valid point that she lies to him too. He doesn't know where she is, he can't get a hold of her, and she never explains herself. So the two break up. Dr. Messner, meanwhile, is continuing to spiral and it all culminates in him transforming the back of the cab into a man from the future, the future man. He's supposed to be an example of an evolved man, what humans will be in one million years, apparently extremely top heavy yet still managing to stand. I can't wait to see the science. He's got psych powers because what self-respecting super evolved man from the 80s doesn't? So we set up our last battle. Issue 23, the future begins today. Kara battles this future man who pulls her hair. Not that evolved, I guess. You can keep pounding on me all you want, but you can't hurt me and I never get tired. How about you? Supergirl needs to figure out who or what this future being is. And while she seeks those answers, a man from her past shows up. Dick Malvern, and that is that is a deep cut. Dick Malvern was Linda's high school boyfriend. He was in the same orphanage as her before they both got adopted, and he was always this close to figuring out that she was Supergirl. We didn't get an explanation for how Dr. Messner turned himself into this evolved being. He decided that the key to unlocking all of humanity's potential lay in evolution, so sought to invent a machine to accelerate the process with a focus on the mind. It worked, but the results terrified him, and so while he still had some remnants of himself, he quickly reversed the process and then set about repressing it. However, power outages meant that the tape recorder didn't always run at night when it was supposed to, and so the future man was able to break forth. Supergirl is able to defeat him by making him think he has killed her, which makes him feel that he is a monster, and she is then able to at least temporarily reverse the process. And he's still wearing those hilarious giant shoulder pads. I accept that they're there though, because they make this scene that much better. And so we end on Kara reuniting with Dick and sharing a kiss with him. She had missed Phil, who had came over to talk with her earlier. The drama. The drama that will never be resolved. This series is underrated. It is so much more than an 80s headband. It ends before its time. It had so many plot threads left to explore, and it had shown it could wrap things up, but leave openings for ideas and characters to be revisited. But let's break it down. Kara feels so fleshed out here. She's confident, slightly sardonic, and determined. She's a bit set in her ways, but she's working on growing. She's expanding, finding her own path. She feels very much like a person, not a caricature. Sometimes people say that Supergirl had no personality before Crisis on Infinite Earths. Some people even go so far as to say as before the Supergirl TV series on the CW. But that's not the case. It's just easier and funnier to point to the more out there escapades. The ill-conceived moments like Comet the Super Horse, the romance, or her time traveling to help Clark who's kind of into her. Those are amusing and they make great content and they're fun to laugh at, but they're not representative of everything that was going on with Supergirl throughout her evolution. She really did and does feel like her own character. She has a presence. There's a firm sense of her, even in her canon leading up to her death. And this series makes her death so much more sad and frustrating because she had shown that she could really 
hold her own as a character. It just took the right writer and concept to pull it off. In my opinion, this was pulling it off. This series is so well constructed, supports you feel unique and add to the tapestry of the world and interact with Kara in different ways and feel like at any point they could step to the fore and drive the action. The Johnny O edition is odd and mileage varies, but at the very least he's treated like a regular character. All the villains could have come back and they made sense and they all presented different threats and levels to Kara. So the battles felt dynamic. Now not everything worked. The council, the kind of shadowy organization, that always felt a bit too vague to feel like a real threat that you should worry about, but it was a good backdrop to bring up new threats. The series found a consistent tone that allowed it to move between different types of stories and still feel like itself. This felt like a series that could have and wanted to run for a long time. They were just starting to set up some serious drama for Linda, like her having to truly find a balance between being Linda and Supergirl. And it would have had a lot of weight because we'd seen all these different relationships established. What was going to happen with Phil and Dick? I need to know. Speaking of the romantic relationships, this series picks a romantic interest and sticks with him. The idea that Kara needs to have romance because girl is not what it comes across as, but rather as another facet of her life. And the relationship goes through an honest evolution and you buy why they're having difficulty. And it doesn't say it as, oh, it's entirely one person's fault. I really wanted to know why he was lying and what he was up to. Was he secretly going and performing those concerts for the bandit? Did he feel bad? That's my headcanon. He's not the most interesting love interest, but he is consciously constructed. And I appreciate that. Cameos don't overwhelm this series and Superman is used very sparingly. And when he does appear, except for issue 21, he doesn't take over or pull focus. It feels like Supergirl featuring Superman, not, oh, look, here's Superman, we don't need Kara anymore. Supergirl can and has held her own, even right next to Clark. I think it can be argued that in the eyes of many fans, she is her own distinct entity, despite sharing a name and color scheme. This series also took its time to give backstories to most things it introduced and spends time with the scenarios it presents. It does some excellent callbacks, like the turn of the mini clones as a full Linda. Mwah. It's not perfect but it's very good. Yes, the narration can wax poetic and there are some 80s-isms. The cop plot goes nowhere and is just abruptly cut off. It does feel a bit like taking Supergirl back to the beginning of that roundabout that they like to put her on. Like, okay, Supergirl goes back to school, now what? And the school part isn't too delved into, but it does execute this idea very well, much better than it had been executed in the past. Personally, I would have read a whole lot more of this series. I think it's clear in how I'm reviewing it that I very much enjoyed it. I had fun. And if it sounds like it's up your alley, then check it out because there are lots of details that I couldn't even get to. I'm gonna stop gushing now and I wanna hear from you, especially if you hated it. You're like, what's wrong with you? Your headband's too tight. What did you think of this series? Honest thoughts on the headband. No judgment, just love. If you hadn't read this series, are you intrigued? Share all of your thoughts down below. While you're down there, please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so that you never miss a vid. Check out the merch if you're interested, and thanks so much for taking this time of your day to spend it discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye!